two speakers in this session. Uh, our first speaker, uh, Charles um, Collins Fekete, uh, was a, awarded a RADNET uh, Career Development Fellowship and then very shortly afterwards was successful in getting a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow uh, in the application of artificial intelligence uh, to personalising radiotherapy. Oh, thank you, Gary. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, I uh, will be talking about my radio mix and deep learning work that I've been doing for lung cancers. But before that, a bit of background about me. I have my PhD in cancer imaging radiotherapy. So the first postdoc in artificial intelligence. And as Gary said, now I'm combining both together and trying to predict some outcome based on the data that we have in radiotherapy. So, okay. Well, that's my step. Um, so I'm going to the big broad statement of my project, which is to predict and prevent adverse reaction, non-cancer treatment. It's a big statement, so I'm going to unfold it a little bit. So first of all, why do I want to work in long cancer treatment? Well, the first reason is because, of, as you might all know, the cancer is very poor survival, uh, which makes it an attractive cancer to work on, but also silver lining for artificial intelligence is a cancer of high occurrence, which makes it a good candidate to start working on to have a consequent amount of data. One of the main reasons why we have such a poor survival, one of the reasons why we have such a poor survival in lung cancer is due to a very, very large diversity in clinical presentation. I've shown that here, where we have two patients suffering from lung cancer, and as you see is the CT slide, which is a proposed functional imaging slides. And although they're very different visually because of the tumor size, the lymph node, invasion, metastasis, for radiotherapy purposes, they'll be categorized into the same group, which means they receive more or less the same radiation dose prescription. In recent radiotherapy, the trend has been to try and increase the dose of the tumor to see if we can get better corrective rate. And what we've found is that if we try to do that for non-small cell lung cancer, we get worse results. We both die more of it for different reasons. But what I've mandated is to bring forward a more sophisticated approach to see what would be the reaction of a patient to radiation based on their personalized imaging type, which is the topic of my own project here, to bring a framework that I will base on machine learning to deliver personalized treatment, to at least to bring it to the clinic. Now, if we take a step back and can think about the radiotherapy workflow, we can think about four more major actors, the technologist, the clinician, the patient, and the medical physicist. When a patient comes in and is diagnosed with cancer that will likely be treated with radiations, they'll go through generally the following steps. So the technologists will acquire a series of data from that patient. We can think about CT imaging, functional imaging, they will collect the patient history and the biopsy. They will use this data, bring them to the clinician, they will make a diagnosis, and if we do radiotherapy, we'll provide some tumor controlling. When that's done, all this data will be transferred on to the medical physicist that will design treatment plan with your radiations to ensure the control of it. And then the patient will report the outcome. Now, artificial intelligence has been helpful in every one of these domains. We can think about AI assisted technologies, where we can think about AI has brought better reconstruction of images for lower dose, for example, or we can use sparse computer tomography to provide a CT scan with a much lower dose. We can also think about the AI as a dead clinician, in which the AI has brought the different formations to help propose potential diagnosis of the tumor. We can think about AI as a dead medical physicist, where we have provided 3D dose distributions that are optimal in rapid time, such that we can do automatic treatment planning to find the best treatment for the patient. But what I am interested in is the AI as a dead patient. So what I mean by the AI assisted patient. I want to provide AI algorithms that provides to the care team, but most importantly to the patient, explainable potential outcome based on a combination of all the data that are available from this patient, including toxicity and survival. And that way, we can ensure that not only the care team, but the patients engage together into the treatment process. And that's a big goal here. And how do we do that? Instead of working in silos, in which one of the areas that I proposed that I've talked about earlier, what my project is about is to combining these areas 
together into bringing out a potential outcome with certain robustness to it and most likely and explainability. So today I'm going to talk about what I've been doing for my first few months in my fellowship, which is only taking two of these um, imaging sets or data sets that we have and trying to link them to outcome with, of course, the gold medal fellowship over the four years to extend them slowly to make a model of models. So how do we combine anatomical images and functional imaging to lung cancer? Well, we do that through the use of either radiomics, which is a known feature, and or deep learning, which was an interest I found. So I've done both. I looked at the first one by the radiomics based analysis in which we combine ex uh, feature information extracted from the patient that represents the tumor volume, the histogram, the density, the texture of patients, feed that into different machine learning methods and get an outcome. And that's how, as of now, we combine anatomical imaging and use them to predict an outcome. The outcome could be two years of survival and so forth. The second way I'm currently investigating right now, and I'm not going to be showing a lot of results, but it is deep learning framework. So convolutional neural network, in which I'm sure many of you have seen such an example. And the only things that I'm really uh, interested in pointing out here is the step at the bottom here where we can extract a feature map at the lowest point of our uh, neural network, out of which we can extract once again deep learning to make features that we can then use to relate those functional imagings, those anatomical imagings to an outcome. This is what I'm interested in, be doing, uh, in doing for my fellowship. As, and concurrently, of course, we're trying to build up a massive database of cancer, lung cancer, radiation, uh, information from patients. So we have established collaboration with universities in Italy, in Germany, in Canada, as well as here, use of partners and work, which includes a series of hospitals around London. We're currently accruing digital pathologic slides uh, for different cancer. We have also pulled from online repository to get this large database that will be useful for AI. And we're also trying to look at the role of AI in new emerging technology, how they can help to predict outcomes, such as dual energy CT and aesthetic uh, corrective CT. So both of them brings new form of information, chemical information, density information that can be used to better link the outcome. So I'm not going to go into any more details here. I want to just thank people that have been working with me, the team, uh, Cancer Research, Radnet, and of course, UKRI for funding my fellowship. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. That was great. And uh, we've got a uh, question from Tony. Hi, thank you. Um, when you look at the histogram of the you know, CT uh, and medical images, you've got you know, millimeter voxels. And when you look at the histology, you've got some micron, potentially some micron resolution. Yes. So in your uh, neural network, how do you take advantage of the fact that there's probably a thousand times difference in length scale? How do you cope with that in your neural network? So one of the ways of doing that is to have different networks for different type of information that we want to extract. So I'm pretty certain that histology, histopathology data will contain um, different information than the anatomical information. So we can think about tumor size compared to tumor cell counts. And so at, at a certain point, we will, the first idea that we want to do is to combine it, have each one of them predict an outcome and have them both together in an ensemble model kind of way. So they won't uh, overlap into and together. Uh, later on, we can think about Emerging information is giving away to each other, but it's something I, I need to explore still. So, so suppose if you look at some simple parameter like skewness yes. at, at two types of images, and you find that they both turn up in both the radiogram feature and the histology feature, what are you going to do about that? There's some additional information yeah. about the biology. That's actually a very good question. Um, that would mandate just looking deeper into it. One of the things that we want to look into is how. So the radio mix definitely, but also the deep learning. And as I was saying in my talk, I want to look at the explainable deep learning. So some things called um, saliency map. So that will uh, help us tell which region of the histopathology um, slider anatomy are important to the decision. And then we can look into it more. We can and see if we can correlate that skewness that could be related to. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, Tim Whitney from King's College London. Thanks for a great talk. Um, with your functional imaging, will you just be using FTG PET or will you be looking at other traces? Um, and if you're only looking at FTG PET, do you think that would be sufficient for you to get uh, decent information here in terms of uh, you know response with lung cancer? That's a great question. Um, we have one to introduce here to balance availability with uh, usefulness. And because most patients are treated with FTG PET and will have mostly accessible kind of data. But uh, as I said, we're collaborating with different hospitals that have slightly different way of treating. For example, our hospital in Canada only scans every single patient to do an CT do virtual and contrast imaging uh, with iodine. So we have this kind of information, but when we look at uh, functional imaging, it's mostly FTG PET. So if you could wave a magic wand and you could put something else in <laughs> on the functional imaging, what would you put in and why? Uh, I wouldn't know enough about different tracers to tell you about that. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much.